And next, our speaker, Martin Chungong. Dr. Chungong made history in 2014. He is from Cameroon. He's the first non-European and non-African to become head of the global organization called the Interparliamentary Union. The Interparliamentary Union gathers parliaments from all over the world, all the members, Congresses, parliaments, to accelerate their action on climate change, the sustainable development goals, maternal and child health, all the global challenges that we're facing. And he has been an incredible leader there. I'm very honored to have him with us in Sun Valley. Came all the way from Geneva, Switzerland. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chungong to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for uh, that uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply privileged to be here today with you uh, addressing this gathering of uh, very energetic persons, activists, civil society organizations, and uh, representatives of uh, philanthropic organizations. I stand here today to talk to you about what a prominent institution of government can do to set this planet on a more sustainable path, what they can do to make sure that we are not going down that path that would lead us to uh, irreversible damage on account of the actions that we are taking today. As I do so, I know that um, Amy has introduced me and introduced the organization that I had, the Interparliamentary Union. I just want to confirm that the Interparliamentary Union has nothing to do with the workers' union. It has nothing to do with the trade union. But it's a global organization, the global organization of legislatures that are committed to working together in order to address global issues, help find solutions to those issues that are plaguing uh, humanity today. And this is the vision that the founding fathers, there were fathers in those days, no mothers, uh, the founding fathers of the organization in 1889 articulated for the IPU using dialogue, discussion, peaceful means and diplomacy to resolve global issues and conflicts instead of going to war. And today this is something that has continued to guide the work that we do at the Interparliamentary Union. I would like during my statement today to show you how parliaments are challenged to use the role that they have, the role that accrues to them in their constitutions to make a change in this world today. Parliamentarians and legislators have specific goals. They are the people who make the laws by which we live in society. They are the people who go after our governors, our executives, to make sure that they are walking the talk, they're implementing what they are supposed to implement in the interest of the people. It is they, legislators, that have the money, they have the budget that they should use to fund uh, programs on sustainability. And so the Interparliamentary Union, the Global Organization of Parliaments, is working adversely to make sure that parliaments are using these powers to good effect today in order to improve upon sustainability. I would also like to say that, of course, there are challenges parliaments face and that they must address in a very robust manner if they have to live up to the expectations of the people. First of all, when I was asked to make this address, I was told I should talk about transforming leadership for the future we want. I want to be sure that we all here have the same understanding of that word, we. Who are we? Obviously, in my view, it is not leaders. Obviously, 
it is the people. So our view of leadership is a set of individuals that will listen to the people's concerns and address those concerns in an effective way, take the aspirations of the people and transform these aspirations into a vision for a better future for mankind. And that is what we are talking about when we talk about transforming leadership today. And today, I would like to use my own experience working with parliaments in order to say, show how parliaments can lead in improving upon current generation, but also the future that the people in their entirety want for this world. And I said about ch challenges, the challenges are there. If you ask the ordinary person in the street, what's a legislature, what's a Congress, the image that comes to their mind is a group of individuals sitting there somewhere in this luxurious environment, squabbling, fighting with each other, throwing, uh, not throwing chairs at each other. You know. It's a group of self-serving individuals, corrupt individuals, who are more focused on their personal interest than on the common good. This is the image that we want to change. We want parliaments to reconnect with the citizen, to regain their trust, because parliaments persistently rank low in popularity ratings. They should be seen to be delivering on the aspirations of the people. And that is the foremost challenge that, that, is the foremost challenge that parliaments today have to address if they can live up to the expectations of the people. And how do we want them to behave? How do we want them to uh, show leadership? How do we want them to transform? First of all, we have to, be, to agree on what it is that we are talking about when we talk of legislators. We are talking of an institution that has to be representative of society as a whole, a society that has to be inclusive, a society, that, or rather, an institution that is, has to be representative, transparent, accountable, and accessible. It is not an institution that lives in an ivory tower. So we have to work for parliaments to transform their leadership by living up to these criteria that are the hallmarks of effective institutions of governance. These criteria have been universally endorsed. And as I have said, if we want, if legislators want to regain the trust of the people, they should be seen to be embodying these criteria that I have enumerated here. So I would say that there is a clear correlation between representation and trust in democracy. If the people do not feel that the institution that is out there, the legislative institution, is representative of their interest, then there will be persistent distrust in that institution. And that is what we are trying to do to make sure that parliaments around the world are inclusive in decision-making. They should represent the interests of women, young people, indigenous groups, other marginalized groups in society in equal measure. It, the parliaments should be the mirror of society as a whole. And later on during this uh, forum, we will be hearing, I think it's later this afternoon, we'll be having a session on how women are transforming the world, women leaders are transforming the world. There's ample evidence that when women are at the table, they make a difference, they make an impact. And that is why transforming leadership into the future, in, for, a fu for a better future, involves including women in decision making. It involves empowering women to become more effective leaders. Similarly, I would like to make a case for young people. Young people feel disenchanted with political processes. They feel left out of decision making and they seek alternative venues for expressing their views, not always to good effect. 
I stand here and want to make a case for involvement, more robust involvement of young people in political processes because they're full of good ideas, they're innovative, especially the millennials who are very adept, adept at using the new technologies to promote freedom of expression. So I would like to suggest that transforming leadership for the future we want requires that we empower young people politically and otherwise. I would like to go to something that I believe you will all recognize here, and it's the major challenge that we are facing today, climate emergency. We do agree that if we continue according to the current patterns, and this has been proven by the recent report of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, if we continue along the path today that we are pursuing, then we are headed for the disappearance of this planet. And so, when we look at the mobilization in the world today for efforts to reverse the irreversible damage of climate change, I think that this challenges all of us, and parliamentarians in particular, to do something about this. And that is why, at the interparliamentary level, we have been working strenuously to get parliaments and legislatures around the world to focus on what it is that they can do to further implementation of the Paris Agreement. And Paris Agreement, yes. In the United States, the president has pulled out of the Climate Change Agreement, Paris, but I'm heartened by what I see in a state like Hawaii, where the legislature is very forthcoming and robust in promoting action at the state level to improve upon the state's, uh, what you call, climate change record. And I want to use the Hawaii example as a business model that we would like to promote at the global level, that is parliaments working to encourage their governments, to urge their governments to put in place a roadmap for transition to cleaner, more sustainable forms of energy. And we have seen that the Hawaii model has worked very well because I think there is a commitment to move to renewable energies, more sustainable forms of energy in a very short period of time. This is something that I would like to encourage at the level of the Interparliamentary Union. I would like to conclude my address here, to say that what we're asking of legislators and legislatures is not out of the ordinary. They have the powers, they have the prerogatives that are enshrined in national constitutions. We are simply asking them to use those powers to address the global issues of the time. And you will agree with me that climate change is one of those major issues in the world today. We are therefore calling on parliaments to transform themselves into leaders for the future that the people want. Leaders will put in place policies. Leaders will domesticate international commitments, such as the Paris Agreement. Leaders who will develop legislation, and we were very pleased that in the past, I would say, 12, 13 years, the number of climate-related legislation in the world today has increased 20-fold. We're very involved in tracking the volume of this legislation, and we realized that there were something like 1,200 pieces of legislation in the world today related to climate change. This is something that I think Parliament should be more forthcoming with. Of course, as I said, climate change is the challenge of the 21st century. Parliaments are challenged to be relevant. Parliaments are challenged to be seen to be relevant because they address 
issues such as resilience, such as reversing the damage of climate change, such as making democracy work for the people. It is only in this way that we would ensure that this planet is set on a sustainable course. I want to say that Parliament's transforming leadership would include embracing the new technologies, using the new technologies to seek innovative ways of engaging with the society, gauging the mood of society, and addressing this mood in appropriate legislation and budgetary allocations. It is important also that parliaments and legislators are forthcoming in defending multilateralism. Not only multilateralism as it existed several centuries, uh, well, in the 19th century when the IP was created, but multilateralism that is more robust in engaging new actors, civil society, activists such as yourselves, philanthropic foundations, and the like, who can work together in a partnership within the framework of the foremost institution of multilateralism, that is the United Nations, to come up with solutions that are owned by the global community. And it is that role that the IPU is promoting for legislatures and parliaments around the world, it is that role that we think can be implemented in order to ensure sustainability in governance, sustainability in seeking solutions for the global issues that are facing us today. Thank you very much for your kind attention.